Thank you again, praise team. Thank you for uh, not only reminding us of what is true, but we, 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 we sing because there's joy that fills our heart as we remind ourselves of those gospel truths. That we know that we need to sink this in not only into our minds, but into our heart and into our souls. And hopefully that bubbles out into a song, a song not just sung with our lips, but a song sung from our hearts. And uh, we're going to continue, I hope, to rejoice and to celebrate in these truths in the preaching of God's Word this morning. If you uh, have your Bible, grabbed a bulletin on the way in, or at least brought your phone with you, turn open, click. Uh, we turn. Uh, into a new chapter this morning, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. If you are new, uh, this is part of a sermon series looking at the first few chapters of Genesis. We're after those foundational kind of truths, those things that we say kind of lies at the bottom of the Jenga tower upon which uh, the rest of what we believe is uh, built. You begin to mess with the foundation, the rest of the tower crumbles. We're looking at those foundational things. And our topic this morning, and actually the topic for the next several sermons is uh, one that we probably don't talk much about. We don't certainly don't hear much about in the world out there, and uh, sadly, increasingly uh, so within the church. I'm thinking about the topic of sin. Sin. Genesis 3 introduces us to uh, sin. So that's where we're going this morning. That's where we're going for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and let's pray. Let's pray as we prepare to hear God's word. And uh, Father, uh, once again, we remind ourselves of the spiritual work uh, that uh, you have called us here uh, to, to engage in. We thank you for uh, the means of grace that you've given us through, through worship, the gathering of uh, two or, or more to glorify and lift you up. And as we turn our attention now to, uh, to, to your word, uh, your very word who declares to, to us uh, who we are and who you are and, and, and the world in which we live, we pray that you would open our minds. Lord, I pray that you would help us to shake off any uh, tired or, or, or weary flesh that, uh, that, that are around us this morning. Uh, give us uh, undivided uh, uh, attention in our minds and in our hearts towards your word and towards your gospel. Pierce our hearts this morning, we pray, uh, through the proclamation of your word and, and the exaltation of, of Jesus Christ uh, even here uh, in, uh, in, in Genesis. And so do this work, do this work, I humbly ask through, through, uh, through me, uh, your, your servant, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Follow along with me as I read our passage this morning, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took it of its fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Amen. Amen. Um, so this morning, uh, as I said, the topic before us, not only this morning, but the next uh, several sermons as we slowly unpack Genesis chapter 3, uh, we're thinking about the fall. All right, Genesis chapter 1 and uh, 2, uh, Bible scholars would fit into the category of creation. Uh, so we spent two chapters thinking about the beauty, the dignity, uh, even the, the glory, the reflected glory of creation. But now as we turn the page to Genesis chapter uh, 3, we're dealing with uh, the fall. I want to begin the sermon this morning simply by calling your attention to uh, verse 1. Notice our passage begins, our passage begins by introducing us uh, to the serpent, uh, the serpent. And uh, right off the bat, you, you might notice that the details are very slim. We're not given a lot of information about the serpent. Um, it's hard to even uh, picture exactly what kind of creature uh, Genesis has in view. We often picture uh, the serpent as a snake, and that's perhaps the case. Maybe, maybe this is some sort of lizard, some sort of dragon, something like that. Not told a lot. Uh, we're told that he's more crafty uh, or more cunning than the other uh, beast of the field uh, that the Lord God 
made. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, the serpent approaches Eve, has this conversation uh, with her, convinces her to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that God had forbidden uh, Adam and Eve to eat from. Uh, and the result, of course, is that Adam and Eve find themselves exiled from their uh, garden paradise, cast out into a world of wretchedness, uh, misery, pain, and sorrow. Uh, for my sermon this morning, um, I want to uh, focus our attention pretty narrowly, or at least I'll try to focus uh, pretty narrowly, uh, on the strategy the serpent employed against uh, Adam and Eve. How is it that this all came about? What was the strategy that the serpent uh, used? Uh, but before we get there, um, I want to share a little bit of background, a little bit of uh, context. This is one of the wonderful things that happens when we study scripture the way that we do, kind of verse by verse and line by line. We must be uh, careful never to pull uh, scripture out of context. Text, as if we can just look at one verse at a time or one passage at a time. And, uh, so I need to remind you of some really important background, some important context. Um, and specifically, I want to remind you of uh, some commandments, some instructions that God had given Adam and Eve prior to Genesis chapter 3. And I'm thinking beyond the real obvious instruction, right, that he says to Adam, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. But God actually gave Adam and Eve some other instructions as well that we need to hold in our minds as we come here to Genesis chapter uh, 3. Uh, so for instance, Genesis chapter 1, if you have your Bible, you can turn back there. If not, it is on the slide. Uh, this is very important to understanding Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1:28. Uh, this is what Bible scholars will call the cultural or creation mandate. Very important instructions that it gives Adam and Eve. Uh, Genesis 1:28 says this, God blessed them, that's Adam and Eve, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and listen, subdue it. Adam and Eve were given the task to subdue the earth and listen to the next instruction, rule over. Rule over uh, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every creature that crawls upon the earth. All right, Genesis 1.28, the creation mandate, the cultural mandate, God gave Adam and Eve authority, gave, him, gave, gave them dominion to uh, subdue creation, and specifically said, rule over every creature. Rule over every creature. So hold this in your mind. You got that? Hold that in your mind for just a moment. I want to give you one more uh, instruction that God gave, and this one just to Adam. So if you go forward now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, uh, in this case, just speaking of Adam, uh, it says, The Lord God took the man, took Adam, put him in the garden, kind of planted him in the garden of Eden, and gave him two things to do to work it and to keep it. Uh, Adam had two things, to work it and to keep it. Before sin came into the world, what was Adam doing in the garden? He was working. What do we can conclude? Work is not something bad, something evil. He's, he is to work in the garden and most importantly, he was to keep the garden. He was to keep it, to, uh, to preserve it, to, to, to guard it. Uh, before I came on to the uh, stage here this, this morning, I, I had my phone in my pocket. I didn't like to bring my phone in my pocket. I gave it to my son and I said, keep this uh, for me. I want him to watch over that phone and I want my phone back here at the end of this uh, sermon. Um, Adam, given the task in the garden to work it and to keep it. Okay, so you have those two commandments in your mind. They're given authority, given dominion over every creation. Adam placed in the garden to work it and to keep it. Now, let's read Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 again and uh, see what this stirs up for us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. What do we have? What do we have here? Suddenly, we have intruding in this perfect world that God had made uh, a serpent. A serpent. Uh, Genesis, as we said, doesn't answer a lot of questions about, uh, about the serpent. We don't know uh, how he got there. We don't know where he came from. We don't know who let him in. He's obviously a danger. He obviously poses a threat. A lot that we don't know, but what do we know? What does Genesis 3.1 tell us? For one, Genesis 3.1 tells us that this serpent is a creature created by God, right? Uh, how else do you read this? Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had 
made. So, so the, the serpent, this is a little bit of a side, the serpent who, who we will find out is the, is the devil, at least that's what, Gen, or that's what Revelation tells us, the ancient serpent is, the, uh, is Satan, is the devil. He's a, he's a created being. So if we, have any, if we came in the doors this morning thinking the universe is ruled by you know, Jesus in one corner and the devil in another corner, you need to put that out of your mind because that's wrong. We don't believe in that dualistic understanding of the universe. No, no the serpent, no Satan is a created being. And because he's a creature, what do we know about his relationship to Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve were supposed to have, listen, authority. They were supposed to have dominion over that serpent. All right? Uh, plain as day. Genesis 128 says, rule over every creature. And here comes this creature. Adam and Eve were given authority over the serpent. Over the serpent. Let me say something even, even more obvious. So we know that this serpent was made by God. Notice that the serpent, where is he? He's in the garden. He's in the garden. What was the specific task that God gave Adam to do? You are to work it and you are to keep it. You are to guard it. You are to watch over it. So Adam, bud, here's your step up. Here, here he is. Here's, here's the serpent. Here's this threat to the garden. God gave you the job to work it and to keep it. And yet, of course, uh, that's not what he does uh, at all. Um, th the problem... Uh, the, the problem, I think, and, and probably as I just look out at the congregation this morning, lots of familiar faces. I know this is, for most of us, a pretty familiar uh, passage for us. The problem with reading very familiar uh, passages of Scripture, um, or, or maybe just engaging in, in history in, in general, is we tend to read it as if everything that is there uh, is inevitable. Right? Do you get what I mean? You, you, you're reading it and you just take for granted that, uh, that you know how the story is going to uh, going to go. That's not the case uh, for, for those who are living in it. Uh, let, let, me give you, let me give you an illustration. Um, yesterday I picked up, I think maybe my fourth or fifth uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln. I like reading, uh, like reading history. Uh, and, uh, you know, no matter how many, maybe any Abraham Lincoln uh, fans in, in here, I got a few, yeah. Um, uh, you know how the story goes, right? You know no matter what book you're reading that uh, they're going to decide to go to Ford's Theater, right? It's, it's inevitable. You know Mary's going to get a headache, but uh, Abraham is going to insist that we still go. You know that John Wilkes Booth is going to leave the bar and he's going to wander up into the, into the booth where uh, uh, Mary and, and Abraham Lincoln are sitting. It's, it's inevitable, right? You can read it as if it is inevitable. But for those who are in the story, right, it's playing out live before for them. When we come to Genesis chapter 3, here's, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Uh, we, we need to recognize that it didn't have to be this way. There's nothing inevitable in Genesis chapter 3 that it had to be this way. Because God had given Adam and Eve dominion over every creature. Uh, he gave them dominion over... Do, do you realize that Adam was given the task to name every animal? Including the serpent? That the, the serpent is called the serpent because Adam gave him that name, the serpent. Adam had authority uh, over him. He gave him the task to work and to keep it. It didn't have to be this way. And, and yes, yes, for the two or three of you sitting here this morning that might be uh, cued into the theological issue of superlapsarianism versus infralapsarianism, if you don't, never heard those words, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm not making a comment about that. I'm simply pointing out the obvious in our text that a text did not have to end this way. God gave Adam and Eve authority over the serpent. It didn't have to unfold the way that it did. Um, so we're going to hold that in our mind. I want to, as I said, explore uh, the strategy. Explore the strategy that the devil, explore the strategy that the serpent used to deceive Adam and Eve. And we're going to see uh, three points of that strategy. The serpent uh, caused uh, Adam and Eve to question the sensibility of God's word, the truthfulness of God's word, and then finally the, the goodness of God's word. So that's, that's how this uh, plays out. Uh, so we'll jump in. Now, first point of strategy that the serpent uses, uh, he begins by uh, causing Eve to question the sensibility of God's word. So as we just follow the text here, we're introduced to the serpent, and then verse 1 says, he said to the woman, uh, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree? 
uh, in the garden. Now, serpent comes up to Eve. This is uh, maybe surprising for a couple of reasons. First of all, that he comes up to Eve and not to Adam. We know that Adam is there the whole time. The end of the story tells us because Eve is going to take that fruit and give it to Adam who was, quote, with her there the whole time. Uh, but this is surprising as well because, uh, as we said, the serpent, we know from Revelation, this is the devil. Uh, this is Satan. We might expect a, uh, a frontal attack, right? This is actually a passage on spiritual uh, warfare. We did an extended sermon series earlier this year on spiritual warfare. And one of the things that, uh, that we noticed back then is, you know, when we think about spiritual warfare, I think often our minds go to the most extreme kind of cases. We think of the movie The Exorcist. Uh, but, but as you look in scripture, as you look at spiritual warfare as it plays out in scripture, the devil often works in much more mundane, uh, ordinary kind of ways. That's what's going on here. The devil is working against even a very mundane, uh, ordinary kind of way. In part because the spiritual war uh, that is going on here is not primarily between you and I and the devil. It's between God and the devil. And, and what, the, what the devil is trying to do here, what the sermon is trying to do is, is create a wedge between Adam and Eve and God. Um, so that aside, first thing that we should notice about this strategy is not the... Um, it's not the argument that the serpent makes, it's the attitude that he betrays. It's not primarily about the argument he makes, it's about the attitude that he uh, betrays. I'm, that's what I'm trying to capture with this, uh, this idea that the serpent uh, caused Adam and Eve to question the sensibility of God's word, the sensibility of God's word. Uh, our text says uh, in the ESV, uh, did God actually say that? Did he actually say that? If you happen to have the NIV sitting open on your lap, it says, uh, did God really say that? Did he really say that? The New King James Version says something like, has God indeed uh, said that? Um, you know, when you're reading the Bible, of course, the tone doesn't come through the written text, but many commentators have made this, this point that the, the, the tone, if we could read into it, would be something like that. Did God actually say that? Did, did he really say that? Really? Really? You know, he's questioning the sensibility of, of, of God's word. Uh, Christopher Walken in his excellent book, Biblical Critical Theory, if you're looking for some great challenging summer reading, I highly recommend that. Uh, he says uh, uh, concerning this, uh, the devil's strategy here, this is, quote, mock-friendly encouragement to doubt God's word. Mock-friendly encouragement to doubt God's word. In other words, what, what's the strategy that Satan is employing? He's mocking God's word. He's, he's questioning the sensibility of it. Uh, the Bible elsewhere will refer to this as scoffing. He's scoffing uh, at God's word. It's, it's more of an attitude than it is a direct argument. Uh, he's not presenting a rational argument against what God has said. He's just displaying this attitude. He's, he's mocking it. Now, this is, uh, is it not, a terribly effective strategy even today. Right? What a terribly effective strategy this continues to be today. The serpent continues to do this work. The world continues to employ this strategy against us today, doesn't it? How much of the rhetoric, and I think that's probably the right word, the rhetoric that is employed against Christians, it doesn't actually fall into the category of a rational debate, something to be argued or discussed. It's more a mocking, scoffing kind of attitude, right? Like, uh, you believe that God created the world in six days? days? Really? Really? You believe that? Uh, you believe all the stuff the Bible says about sex and sexuality? Really? You believe that? Um, I remember it uh, many years ago, almost 19 years ago at our uh, at my bachelor uh, party night before uh, to, to get married to Laura. We had, you know, family and friends in town celebrating with us and somebody pulled me aside and said, you know, uh, you and Laura uh, didn't uh, live together before you're going to get married tomorrow? Well, really? You guys haven't slept together yet? Well, really? You know, understand that he's not interested in having some sort of conversation. He's not interested in engaging in some sort of debate with me. just wants to mock just wants to scoff at what God's word has uh, said. Uh, you, you believe all that the Bible says about gender be, being a gift, uh, part of God's good design rather than something we choose for ourselves? Really? You, you believe all that 
that stuff that the Bible says about the, the roles of, of husbands and wives? Really? Yeah, you understand that, that people who employ strategies like this are not interested in the conversation with you. They're interested in mocking, interested in scoffing. It's the same strategy that the serpent employed here against Eve. Questioning first the sensibility of God's word before we even, even are introduced to an argument against his word. Uh, the, the serpent here is inviting Eve to sit in judgment on God's word, to, to, to allow Eve to evaluate for herself whether or not it is a sensible thing at all to trust what God has commanded. Um, and, and of course, uh, we, we see here a subtle twisting of, uh, of, of God's word from the lips of the serpent. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And you know, God didn't say you can't eat of any tree in the garden. He's beginning to twist it already. Um, and then we look at Eve's response. A woman said to the serpent, uh, you may, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, uh, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And listen to what she says next. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh, the serpent twisted God's word, and now here we have Eve twisting God's word just a bit. Remember, the prohibition was not uh, that Adam and Eve uh, not touch the fruit. It was that they not uh, eat the fruit. Uh, so Eve here is guilty of, uh, of twisting God's word. Again, Christopher Walken in Biblical uh, Critical Theory says, uh, quote, that this is the, uh, we see here uh, in the, in the, the, from the lips of Eve, the birth of false religion. Uh, the birth of false religion. What's, what's false religion? It, it's, it's when we, we take what God's word has said and we, we add to it uh, just a little bit to suit our own uh, needs. We, we go a little further than the text uh, requires or maybe don't go quite as far. That's false religion. That's what uh, Eve uh, is interested uh, in, in, in doing here, what she falls into doing. So um, the, the serpent questions the sensibility of God's word and what's Eve's response? She actually makes it insensible. She makes it insensible. Um, okay, so that's strategy number one. The serpent questions the sensibility of God's word. Secondly, uh, what we see here is the serpent questions the truthfulness, the truthfulness of God's word. So here, here we are right at the frontal attack uh, that the serpent is going to make against Eve, uh, the shift from the, the attitude that uh, the beginning of the passage portrays to the actual argument. And uh, right here at the heart of it, the serpent questions the truthfulness of what God God had said. So let's look at this in the passage. Uh, verse 4, uh, the serpent responds to Eve and says to the woman, uh, you won't surely die. You won't surely die. Of course, this is the exact opposite of what God had earlier said. 180 degrees in the other uh, direction. Genesis uh, 2, 16 and 17. If you have your Bible, you can, you can cast your eyes on that. I don't have a slide. Uh, God says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day, of you eat, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Black and white. Couldn't be clear. And now we hear from the lips of the serpent saying, you won't surely die. Uh, the serpent is questioning the truthfulness of God's word. Questioning the truthfulness of God's word. This is what we call in our day uh, alternative facts, right? <laughs> this, is, this is the birth of alternative facts. Uh, you, you, you've got your facts? Well, uh, the devil, he's got his facts. Uh, you've got your truth? Well, I have uh, my uh, truth. The serpent here just wants to speak uh, his truth and demands to be heard. Uh, you know, in, in a flat universe, in a universe where there is no God, maybe this makes perfect sense. Uh, in our enlightened world that rejects uh, uh, anything that can't be observed with our physical eyes, that's the logical conclusion. You've got your truth, I have my truth. Who's to say who's correct? Who has the right? Who has the authority to determine who's right and who's wrong? All you have is what you said or what I said. You've got your truth, I've got my truth. But the world that is presented to us here in Genesis is not a flat world. The world that is presented to us here in the opening pages of the Bible is not a flat world. And do you understand what I mean by flat world? I don't mean flat, flat, uh, physically flat. I mean it's a, it's a multi-dimensional world. The, 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 uh, the world that Genesis presents to us is a world that is ruled over by a God who stands above 
beyond, before uh, it all. He is the sole arbiter of what's right and wrong, what's true and false, what's good and evil. He's, he's, he's over top of the world. Um, here's an here's a illustration, the best illustration I can think of to try to make this point. How many of you here have ever received uh, artwork from a preschooler? <laughs> Yeah, most of us, right? You, you receive something from your, from your three-year-old, maybe mom, dad, and uncle, they gave it to you, and you, you look at it, and you say, oh, sweet, this is wonderful. I really love the, uh, you know, I love the cat that you drew. And you show it to somebody else, and they say, no, it's a camel. And somebody says, no, it's a calf. Who's going to determine who's right? What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. The solution's real simple. What do you do? You go back to the three-year-old, right? You go back to the creator of it, and you say, hey, sweetie, what is this? What is this? Right? That, that, in a nutshell, is our doctrine of revelation. Right? That, in a nutshell, is our doctrine of revelation. That we believe that there is a God who stands above, beyond, and before creation. Who has chosen to make himself known. But he's not chosen to make himself known like some preschooler. Uh, this is the argument of postmodernism. That because we are so finite and our brains just don't work, even if God makes himself known, we couldn't understand it. Now that's an affront to God. That's an affront to God because I believe that God is big enough and, and, and wise enough to make himself known in such a way that we can understand what he said. Adam and Eve knew exactly what God had said. There's enough of this business of you have your truth and I have my truth. Uh, Genesis flatly rejects that uh, altogether. So that's the strategy. The serpent questioning the truthfulness of God's word. Uh, maybe that's a little bit of how it works out in the, in the world out there. Here's how this works within the church. Um, we don't say things like, uh, I just need to speak my truth. But we do say things like this. Well, that's just your interpretation. Yeah, that's just your uh, interpretation. Um, now, is, is the Bible, uh, is God's word, is, is this revelation here, is it open to uh, interpretation? Does, in other words, does, does the serpent here, does he just have his own interpretation and it's just a valid interpretation? There's a couple things that we need to acknowledge as we seek to answer this question. On the one hand, we do need to acknowledge that there are plenty of things within the Bible that are difficult to understand, right? How many of you do in the Bible reading plan still? We finally got out of the first five books of the Bible. You into Josh, but moving along pretty good there. Uh, there's plenty of stuff in there that's hard to understand, isn't there? Uh, when you move forward even to the New Testament, the Apostle Peter at the end of his letter is going to say regarding Paul that there's plenty of things in Paul that are hard to understand. There are some things that are uh, hard to understand. And, and, and so, yeah, there are times when we need to wisely, with the help of the Spirit, seek to interpret, seek to make sense of what God has revealed. Uh, we, we do so with, you know, Scripture interpreting Scripture. And so, so, yeah, we understand there are some things that are difficult to understand within the Bible. On the other hand, on the other hand, we affirm uh, that, that, uh, that, that that which is necessary for salvation is plainly laid out in God's word. That it's there and it's clear and it's black and white. Second Peter uh, uh, chapter 1 says his divine power has given us everything that we need. Paul in Romans chapter 1 says all men are without excuse. That, that we have no excuse for, for not knowing the, the, these, these basics. God has made it known. And, and so, yeah, there might be room for interpretation, but when we're talking about the foundational kind of things, and that's what we're after here in this sermon series, when we're talking about the fundamental kind of things, when we're talking about the gospel, when we're talking about those things that are necessary for salvation, it's laid out plainly and clearly, and so we can't say, well, that's just your interpretation. Satan, the serpent, does not just have his own interpretation of it. What he says is wrong. It's wrong. He's questioning the truthfulness of God's word, and he's wrong. So, uh, number one, the serpent questions the sensibility of God's word, kind of puts her on a slippery slope, uh, enticing her to adopt this attitude. Then he begins this kind of frontal attack, questioning the truthfulness of God's word, but he doesn't stop there. There's something very important in the text I want you to, I want you to see that I actually think is probably more the, more the real crux of uh, what the serpent does to cause Eve to fall. And this is it. The serpent questions the goodness questions the goodness of God's word, the goodness of it. Look at the text with me, verse 5, for God knows, this is the serpent speaking to Eve, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now this is fascinating. 
This is fascinating, particularly when you consider what the serpent does not do uh, in this passage. For instance, he does not come to Eve and calls her to question the existence of God. Doesn't, doesn't cause her to question, you know, doesn't make her an atheist. Uh, doesn't come to Eve and maybe calls her to question the, the power, or at least not directly, the power or the ability of God. What's he go after? What's he go after with us even today? What's the lie that every one of us believes? It's that the, the God's word is not good. He goes after the goodness of God, the goodness of God's word. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. See, so the argument is this. God's holding back on you. God doesn't want you to be happy. God doesn't have your best interest in mind. This, I believe, is the crux of the argument. It forms the basic strategy that is used against God's people today. That real life... Real happiness is to be found apart from the restrictive rules of God. And it makes as much sense as the fish longing to be free of the oppressive uh, ocean and up on to the land. We believe, I, I believe that we believe in our heart of hearts that uh, God is holding back uh, on us. We fail to trust his goodness. Right? Isn't this why you sin? Or at least one of the reasons why you sin. Isn't this why, you know, even, even later this week, you're going to be led into doing something, thinking something, seeing something that you know you shouldn't see? Because deep down inside, deep down inside, you believe that that forbidden fruit will give you something that, either, that God either cannot or will not. We sin because we believe Satan's lie, that God is holding out on you. That his way is too restrictive. That it's too stifling. I read an interesting quote from John, uh, George Orwell. You know that novelist. Um, not been pertaining to this passage. Uh, but I think that's what's going on here. We've, it's like a man sitting on a branch of a tree. Slowly sawing away at that branch. Because he believes that below him is a bed of roses. Only to find out it's full of nothing but barbed wire. That's what happened here in the garden. We want to be free. We want to be that fish that climbs out of the water to be free of the oppressive, uh, oppressive ocean. We want to, we keep sawing and sawing away from that branch that supports us, thinking there's something better. There is nothing better. The serpent presents to weave a better path. The, the real way to happiness, to human flourishing. Listen, the serpent presents to Eve an empowering vision of human flourishing to help her reach her full potential. That's what's going on here. The serpent is presenting to Eve an empowering vision to help her to, to, to reach her full potential. That through human achievement, through, hu through human striving, go grab that fruit, Eve, you can experience the real goodness that that fruit, forbidden fruit can offer. The very next time the slithering serpent comes up to you, I want you to think of this passage. Next time he comes up to you and tempts you, yeah, to look at something you shouldn't look at, to do something you shouldn't do, to say something you shouldn't say, to think something you shouldn't think, to hold on to something you shouldn't hold on to, ask yourself this, do I, do I really believe this lie? Do I really believe that God's ways are not the best ways? Do I really believe that that forbidden fruit will do something for me that God cannot or will not do? That's the lie that the devil presents to us. Let's look what happens here. So the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, and so she took of its fruit and ate. The strategy worked. And do you see something really interesting that's going on here? It says the woman saw that the tree was good for food. We saw this pattern, didn't we, in Genesis 1 over and over and over again. God looking down and God saw and God saw and God saw that it was good. And now here we have Eve who's looking and declaring as if she's already God, seeing that it is good. She's already decided for herself what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. Uh, at the end of the day, Eve chooses her impressions made with her eyes rather, the instruction, rather than the instructions given to her by God. She chooses her impressions rather than the instructions that she received. Um, and of course, the verse 6 finishes it, with, uh, finishes it for us. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, standing by her side the whole time, and he ate it. 
and there is the fall. There is the fall. We're going to pick up with verse 7 uh, next week, but I want to read it here. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Previously, they were naked and unashamed. Now, they're naked. They're full of shame. They sewed these fig leaves uh, together. Uh, but I want, to, I want to finish the sermon this, this morning uh, reminding you of um, something we said in the beginning of the sermon that um, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. God gave Adam and Eve authority. He said, rule over every creature. He says to Adam specifically, I'm putting you in the garden to work it and to keep it. It didn't have to be this way, but he failed. Adam failed. Eve failed. And because they failed, not only did they bring sin and misery upon themselves, they brought sin and misery upon all mankind. But you know, the Bible actually tells the story of two Adams. There's two Adams actually uh, in the Bible. The, the first Adam, of course, is here in uh, Genesis. The first Adam failed, but there is another Adam. And if some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. It is Jesus. This is the, the case that the Apostle Paul is going to make in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans 5. That Jesus is for us a second uh, Adam. That humanity got another chance, if you will, with uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And if I could just give you one uh, short passage to help us to, to understand this, we'll end with this. Romans 5.19 uh, puts it this way. It says, for as by the one man's disobedience, Paul is talking about the first Adam here, uh, they were made sinners. The first Adam failed. The first Adam failed to step up. He should have squashed the head of the serpent as soon as he came into the garden, but he didn't do that. Because he didn't do that, sin came in the world. But he says, but so by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. See, we remember that Jesus, our second Adam, Adam also was confronted by the slithering serpent, right? Out in the wilderness. He was presented with forbidden fruit, if you, if you will. But Jesus overcame. Jesus did what the first Adam failed to do. And listen, listen to how Paul uh, continues this argument. This gets a little heady, but I think you can follow. It says, now the law came in to increase the trespass. Sin came into the world, then comes the law. And where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And listen to this. So that as sin reigned in death, which came in through Adam, the first Adam, grace might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death came into the world through the first Adam. But life, eternal life, comes into the world through the second Adam. That, friends, is the invitation to the gospel to find ourselves uh, to be sinners in Adam, but to see the eternal life that is offered to us in Jesus Christ, the second Adam who did what the first Adam failed to do. That's what we are invited to step into. That's what I, as your pastor, invite you to step into even this, this morning, to, 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 to behold with your mind and to behold with your heart Jesus, the second Adam, who did what the first Adam failed to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And Jesus, we, uh, we, we look to you maybe this, this morning with, with fresh eyes and realizing that the temptation that you uh, endured, the way that you took on uh, uh, temptation and, and, and took on the accusation of the serpent as he came to you. We rejoice, uh, Jesus, that you uh, are uh, victorious uh, over that. We, we thank you that uh, even, even though you were uh, victorious and righteous, yet you still chose to go to the cross for us who failed, us who are in Adam, who continue to be in sin and misery. We thank you that you rose uh, from the dead. We thank you that you are seated at the right hand of God the Father. Lord, I, I pray, uh, Jesus, I pray for, for any who, who are here this, this morning, who have not yet tasted of that eternal life, who has to continue to believe the lie of the serpent, that there is some sort of life to be found in the forbidden fruit, uh, who, who are pursuing that empowering uh, human uh, uh, vision of human flourishing, found through our own achievements, found through our own works. We are so weary with chasing after one thing, after another, after another, thinking that that will give us life. 
our, our, our bodies are weary, our souls are weary. Jesus, I pray that you, you by, by the work of your Holy Spirit, would, would woo us, would bring us back uh, uh, into loving relationship with you through the cross. Father, I pray that you would renew that, renew that zeal, renew that love uh, for us. We pray in particular, yes, for, for any who have not yet tasted of that. Lord, would you do that spiritual work in them? Even this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.